Thank you. Um, it really is a great pleasure to be with you in these rather illustrious surroundings. They make where I work day to day look rather dowdy. Um, I'm sorry I haven't been able to be with you for longer. We have a rather important debate this afternoon in the Commons on health, um, which has uh, meant that my whips, you know, tolerant though they always are and very patient and understanding at all, all times, um, say they would like me back for four o'clock. So apologies for that too. And thank you for waiting. Um, I know you've had a long and I hope an interesting day. So I'll try to be brief and you know, at least somewhat interesting in my own way. Uh, I think I'm quite unusual in a shadow prisons role in that this is a job that I came into politics really wanting to have. Um, you know, I, I have a very keen interest in crime and justice and prisons and probation in particular. And I think sometimes it's seen as a job that you're given maybe as a stepping stone or something like that, but, you know, or perhaps on your way back down. But this is, um, this is a role that I was very keen to have. And I first went to work in a prison when I was 19 in the psychology department at HMP Frankland near Durham. And I obviously went to the wrong prison for my interview. I turned up at Durham Prison, and I'm told that's a very frequent mistake and has been made many, many times since. And I went on to complete a six-month stretch at Dartmoor before returning to Franklin. And I went to Franklin a couple of weeks ago, actually, for a, a visit in my new role. And it might give my age away slightly, but um, it was more than 15 years gap between working there and going back again. And I don't know how many colleagues here uh, work in prisons or have had reason to visit, but I've noticed some quite big differences uh, in that 15-year time. And I have to say the, the most striking one to me was the smell. I had quite a sort of a fond memory of the odour inmate that we used to have in the early 90s. And I can report with confidence that that is now gone. All the prisons I visit now, they, they are quite fresh. So I've been asked to speak this afternoon about striking the balance between punishment and reform. So the title I've been given, it's a bit like an essay title from university, but it places punishment on one hand and reform uh, on the other. And it does suggest that a criminal justice system administering a dose of each is doing its job. Too much reform is pandering to offenders' needs and ignoring the victims. Nothing but hard punishment fails to rehabilitate or tackle the reasons for reoffending. But in reality, as most of us have come to realise, punishment and reform are not actually opposites at all, but they're deeply interconnected. And I think when you asked a question like this, you'll set something like this, you, you can either say, um, what we need is both, and everyone goes away saying, oh yes, that's what we need, or you go, they're interconnected. I'm going for interconnected. Politicians um, are often accused of populism in crime and justice, and I think that that is probably a valid criticism, and, but I think it's one that I can completely understand. Um, frustration with a criminal justice system that consistently failed to put communities and victims sufficiently at the centre has led politicians as, so far, the only directly accountable part of the system that is about to change, as we are learning, to speak up for the views that they hear day in, day out, on doorsteps and in their surgeries. Faced with the pain and impotence of victims, and the tired resignation of local communities, it's not surprising that politicians try to gain the initiative with criticism of judges, heaven forbid, public association with high-profile victims, and tough words on reforming the system. So, acknowledging the risk of being populist, I think it's right that punishment is central to our criminal justice system, it is important for communities to see, and importantly, it is also necessary for rehabilitation. When a person causes damage, harm, or hurt to others, we expect a sentence that fits the crime, and I don't think 
Any amount of persuading otherwise will convince communities to see it any different, and neither should they. And I do agree with Louise Casey when she said that victims of crime have a very clear idea of what sentencing should be about. They would like to see punishment first, followed by reparation and rehabilitation. And victims are good to listen to, as I'm sure many of you know, because they know what punishment matters and it's not just an end in itself, but it's a step on the path to rehabilitation. Now, of course, it's not the only step. Often dealing with addiction, mental health, attitude change. My uh, chief probation officer, or chief executive of my probation trust, rather, came to see me recently, and I asked him what the main issues were in Darlington, in my constituency. And he said, you know, it's alcohol, it's drugs, and you know, the normal stuff that he would say. And then he said, we've got a big attitude problem in Darlington. <laughs> so I'm going to see him again on Friday and see how he's getting on with that. <laughs> Victims want punishment. You know, sometimes they do want it for retribution. But I think they know something more than a desire for revenge. Victims understand that serving time or completing an intensive alternative is a necessary step on the path to rehabilitation. Punishment matters because it's a consequence. It's directly linked to the offence. It's the community's disapproval. Anger and loss made real. And I know there are colleagues here who represent communities, and you will know probably better than many just how being living somewhere where crime is high can have a real exhausting effect on a community. And punishment is meant to be tough. You know, it's not just for public confidence, but because without it being tough, it isn't a punishment. And without punishment, we miss out this vital first step to rehabilitation. But punishment alone is not enough. And, you know, the prison educators who tell the newly incarcerated young offender how he taught his father car mechanics when he was inside knows this better than most. And that's, you know, it's a conversation I've heard more than once in young offenders institutions. You know, they see a young man come in, and then not that many years later, they see that man's son come in, and that must be a, quite a depressing thing for a professional working in that environment. So failure to re rehabilitate lets down the offender, the victim, and both of their families. Punishment is the consequence of crime, but reform must be the consequence of punishment. It's not something we want to have to repeat again and again. By the time an offender enters the criminal justice system, there's already been at least one victim too many. And by the time they leave, the achievement for us should be that there'll not be one more. Not only does the system need to be prepared to both punish and rehabilitate, it also needs to be prepared to find savings without compromising public protection. And I'd say that is the single biggest challenge that we face as a group of professionals. This is a very real challenge, and one that I know our probation officers up and down the country are well used to wrestling with. While punishment and reform may be intertwined, delivering effective punishment and reform, as well as budget cuts, are not. This is the real challenge to professionals in the criminal justice system today. And it's not a new challenge. It's not something we've never had to face before. And some of the solutions might be better than the practices they replace, but it's a challenge nonetheless. It is no surprise to those who work with offenders or victims that punishments which recognize the impact of the crime can be the most effective at preventing future crime. Community payback, I'm told, has a 25% reoffending rate. Restorative justice is effective and popular with victims, and neither has to be expensive. Early intervention, preventing crime, reducing reoffending, these are the best efficiency measures ever imagined. Half of male and one third of female sentenced prisoners have been excluded from school. Two thirds have numeracy skills at or below that expected of an 11 year old. 
half have reading and 82% writing ability at or below that expected of an 11-year-old. Around 70% of prisoners suffer from multiple mental health disorders in startling contrast to the general population where the figure is between 2 and 5%. You know, this isn't news to many people here, but I think it bears repeating. And these are the statistics that we need to focus on. If we spend our money wisely in the first place, we won't have to spend it again. On a visit to St Giles Trust in Camberwell yesterday, I spoke to ex-offenders and heard about the work they do. And I heard just how much is spent on some individuals who offend repeatedly. Well, you know, we know that. You know, they bang at it in their communities for 10 or 15 years. You know, hundreds and thousands of pounds, sometimes millions, leaving a trail of hurt and disruption before work is done to help prevent future crimes and turn their lives around. But we must not waste the existing and effective in the rush for the new and exciting. The government's health bill that we've been debating this afternoon proves that being visible from space is not always the best attribute to aim for. Now, that's quite a hard lesson for politicians because we like to do things that make an impact and get a lot of attention. So to say things, we want to change things quite a bit, but not very much is uh, not really what we're trained to say. So we do need to learn to cherish and nurture the smaller, the more innovative projects that work and help to replicate the best practice without squeezing out those best places to provide it. I see this a lot. I go around the country. I've visited many, many projects where you've got excellent practice working with offenders, meeting people at the prison gate, making sure they get housing, making sure they get access to the right services. And then you go to another area, and there's a dis different group of people, different charity, different probation trust, working with the governor in a slightly different way. And if it works, I don't have a huge problem with that. And what I don't want to see is that excellent, you know, those excellent projects maybe working with offenders' families or victims' groups. I don't want to see that lost, and I think that's, there is a real danger that that might happen, so I think we need to guard against that. But these intelligent innovators, they look to the resources that they have, and they make them work the best they can, and the prison service must do the same. So just as an example, our prison staff resource, our prison officers, you know, they're underutilized, they're unappreciated, they're too often not trained to their full potential, and too often they're not encouraged to make the most of the opportunities to inspire, to educate, to rehabilitate the offenders that they're responsible for. And we'll never improve outcomes and reduce reoffending without the active support and engagement of prison officers. They're the ones who are there when the bad news arrives, when the visitor doesn't come, and when parole is refused. It's the prison officer who holds the most insight into an individual's behaviour and has the greatest opportunity to help improve it. Now, that's an interesting conversation for me and the POA to have, but it's beginning. So the government can't leave rehabilitation to the third sector or specialist services and neglect the most influential people in the lives of inmates. Now, my party, I would argue, does have a strong record on crime. You know, during our time in government, there were fewer victims and the chance of being a victim was at a historic low. The British Crime Survey data, recorded crime numbers, you know, both show that crime fell between 1997 and 2010 and we are very proud of that. Tackling crime and supporting victims will always be a central part of a progressive political agenda. Everybody is affected by crime. But if you can't afford security or to move away from antisocial behaviour, you suffer more. And if I can't afford insurance because there's lots of burglary where I live, then having my house broken into is a financial as well as a personal disaster. And it's not just party goers who have to walk home late at night, but also low-paid female workers 
and they will always be a priority for the Labour Party, and that's why crime will always be a priority for my party. So, we, could I wind up? So, this is so you're so polite. Where I normally give speeches, that it's sort of uh, someone just stands up and that's it. So, uh, <laughs> I appreciate the uh, ability to to conclude. So, just to finish, then, I do know the hard work that goes on by staff across all of the criminal justice system, and I'd I'd like to pay tribute to the dedication, but I also appreciate the frustration and the challenges that are faced at every turn. And that's why, at the end of our policy review, which we are, I think, still a year away from completing, um, I'm determined that we will have a justice policy which works for staff in the justice system and the communities that they serve. Thank you. Thank you very much.